Your Bibles are still open to Luke chapter 2. If you would, please, if you need the notes this morning, just hold your hand up. The men are ready to serve you with those. Again, let me remind you about tonight, the evening service. We have the final production of the musical and drama, Christmas at Home. And so you want to be here for that in the evening service and stay for refreshments also uh, following that. Christmas messages. Always a challenge, always something. There's so much about it. Most Christmas messages fall into a couple of categories. One is theological and the other is very practical. Our Lord willing, we'll do both. That's what we try to do around here, do both. It's got to be practical because all the Bible tells us, everything in there is for our instruction in righteousness. So we're looking this morning at the lessons on Christmas character. Christmas character. One of the great things about the Bible, and in particular about the Bible story about Christmas and the events surrounding that, is the people we get to meet. I was thinking about that and dwelling upon that, even not just the folks in the Christmas story, but throughout the Bible. I've been saved since the age of 19, so I've been saved five years now. <laughs> well, maybe a little more. But as I began thinking about that, see, if you, the longer you've studied the Bible, the more you've heard the Bible preached, the more you've looked at it, you get to the place where you, you really know the people in the Bible. And I began thinking about that. It says, I've known the people in the Bible. When you think about Abraham and David, and as we look at Mary and Joseph today and others, I've known them just about longer than anybody else in the world besides my parents that I've known. I've known them. You study them, you read about them, you think about them, you, you look at their good side, you look at their bad side, you look at the challenges, and you just begin to know them. Anybody else feel that way? I hope you do. You just begin to know him. You mention David and certain things come to mind. If somebody would tell you something about David, you say, that doesn't ring true to the David I know. Or you might say, yeah, that sounds like the David I know. Uh, we know them from the Bible. So looking today, we're looking at a couple of the major characters here in the Christmas story and let God speak to us as we begin to learn them and what we know about them and how we can apply it to our own hearts and to our own lives. Of the people in the Bible story, the ones we're looking at today, there's really nothing negative we find in the Bible about them. But God teaches us some about their character. And so as we look at the story, as we look at the theological aspects as far as the birth of Christ, we're also focusing primarily today on the character of them and how it applies to us. You know, in each person, there's so many aspects of their character, both good and bad in most cases. But we're looking today just at two characteristics of each one so that we might be challenged and helped. So when we leave here, and you read, hopefully you'll read with your family or with your kids or your grandkids the Christmas story. You can bring out some of these things or you can talk about these things or in your own life saying, God, I, want, I need that in my life. I need that character trait in my life. So the idea is if we can model the good aspects of their character, that we too could be somebody that God uses. Somebody that we can be a ready vessel to be used. Because as we look at Mary and we look at Joseph and we'll look at the shepherds, Lord willing, this morning. I think we'll look at the Magi uh, Wednesday night. They were ready to be used. They were equipped to be used. So regardless of what God has for me, what, regardless of what God has for you in our lives, we need to have the character, we need to have the behavior, we need to have the heart, we need to have the attitude, always to be ready vessels for God. So as we look at this amazing story, this great event, it comes down to their character, that God was able to choose them, that God was able to use them. So this morning, let's let God speak to us about the character of these folks and let God speak to us about our character so that our lives will always be ready to be used by God. So I need you to nod with me. I need you to smile at me sometimes. I need to let you let, speak back to me. Don't get that Christmas look already, all right? So you've had too much turkey or whatever it is that you're worried about. But let's let God speak to us this morning about lessons on Christmas character. Maybe a little different kind of a Christmas message, but one that we need to help us. So first of all this morning, and I, hope, I trust you'll learn something because it is from God's Word. Number one, we look at Mary. We look at Mary. Oh, what a wonderful woman she was. What a wonderful woman. Can we say this? She is because she is in heaven just like where I'm going. Amen? But she was a wonderful woman while she was here on the earth. And we notice, and the first thing that always comes to our mind, or comes to my mind, when we think about the character of this young lady, this probably just a teenage lady, we find, number one, she was a woman of, of course, purity. 
a woman of purity. And the Bible tells us there in Luke 1, 27, that she was to a virgin espouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And when the angel was speaking to her, then said Mary unto the angel, How, this, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Jesus Christ was virgin born. Make no mistake about that. It wasn't just some German soldier that came through. It wasn't just some way that God tried to cover it up. Virgin born. Mary had known no man. She was a pure virgin in her body and in her spirit. And as that virgin, Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, so he would not have the same tinted blood that you and I have. And so she was a virgin. She is a wonderful woman, and she portrays that character of purity. Now, Let's just clarify, and I don't mean to be bashing Mary at all, but Mary was not perfect. She was pure in her nature and in her body, but not perfect. There is no such thing as the Immaculate Conception. In other words, the, uh, the Catholics often teach that Mary herself was virgin born. That's a lie. Are you with me? You're already mad at me. I'm sorry. All right. She was not virgin born. Mary's mother was not a virgin when she was born. Mary did not stay, by the way, Mary did not stay a virgin after the birth of the Lord. You know, the Bible says, make, makes it very clear that Joseph did not know his wife until after Jesus was born. But after that, they had children also. In Matthew 13, 55, they said, Is not this, speaking about Christ, the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joes and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Which then has this man all these things? So he had half-brothers and half-sisters as well. So Mary and Joseph had a regular family after that also. So she was not perfect. She was, did not live a sinless life because she's just a sinner saved by grace just like all of us. For the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No matter how good she was, she was still a sinner and she did not stay a virgin. She had to be saved by trusting her son for, save, for salvation just like you and I. But she was Pure. She was a woman of purity. She was pure in body and spirit, and that was required because of prophecy, for one thing. We've been preaching through on Sunday mornings through the book of Isaiah. And we just saw about two weeks ago that God said, I'm going to give you a sign. A sign to give you hope. A sign to give you faith. A sign to, to help you in your life. And he said, that, that sign, behold, a virgin shall conceive. And so that we know that the prophecy of our coming Savior was from a virgin. A pure woman. Aren't you glad he was virgin born? Like no one else ever has been and no one else ever will be. But the purity for the virgin birth was required for prophecy. And it was required for testimony's sake. You say, but what do you mean testimony's sake? If Jesus had been the second child, nobody would have believed him to be the Son of God. If Joseph and Mary had been immoral or impure, no one would believe. So the virgin birth was vital for the testimony as we understand who Jesus Christ is. So as we learn the character of, of Mary, the first thing is her purity. By the way, God is still far purity. We can't say purity is just for the Bible characters. We can't say purity is just for uh, the certain religious group. We can't say purity is just for others. Purity is for all of us. That's one of the characteristics. See, if Mary had not been pure, she could not have been the mother of Christ. As simple as that. That was one of the criteria. So as Jesus, we know God already had it all planned. But if the Lord was saying, okay, who am I going to use for this? Well, they said, well, I was going to use so-and-so, but they blew it. I use it. No, it was purity. That's why if we're going to stay the vessels God wants us to be, to be available for God's use, we must be people with, of purity. Of purity. So, ladies, let's model purity. Model purity in your life. That means your actions need to be actions of purity purity. Even as we watch the life of Mary, we don't find anything that's impure, anything that was wrong. The closest thing we find in the Bible about Mary that was not all maybe ought to be is when she wanted Jesus at the wedding to help out because they'd run out of wine. And he said, my, it's not my time. It's not my time. But other than that, such purity. So ladies, let's model purity in your actions. Actions. By the way, there's nothing wrong, ladies, about acting pure, acting modest, acting ladylike. 
Model purity in your actions. Model purity in your appearance. Boy, let's make sure you dress modestly. Make sure you dress in purity. Let your attitude be of purity. Just a pure person. Now, lest you think we're talking just the ladies, fellas, we need to be pure also. God doesn't have a division. He said, okay, ladies need to be pure, but guys, you go do your thing. We heard that old expression, boys will be boys. Usually that applies, means sinners will be sinners. All right? Men were to be pure. Joseph was obviously pure also. That's why when he was thinking on those things, that's why he was worried about those things, he, because he knew it could not be his. So let's maintain purity. Mary and Joseph kept themselves pure in this espousal time, in this dating time, in this engaged time. Because see, relationships outside of marriage, those physical relationships outside of marriage, it defiles Christ when Christians do that. Merry Christmas. Virgin born. Relationships outside of marriage defiles marriage itself. It degrades Christ. It's destructive to trust between a man and woman years later. Keep yourselves pure. Keep yourselves right. So we find she was a woman of purity. Oh, pre preacher, what should I learn from Mary? Number one, purity. Live our life, our actions, our attitude, everything we do in as pure a way as we can, as much as God would help us to. Secondly, Mary was a woman not just of purity, but we find she was a woman of submission. Of submission. Well, I'm making lots of people happy today. That's a woman of submission. Yeah, you know, the word submission, we don't always sometimes like that. But submission refers to a military term, means voluntarily putting yourself under the authority of another. Yeah, you know, we've got a jarhead. I mean, a, a Marine here, all right? I'm just teasing him. He knows that. I was in the Navy for ten and a half years, and Marines and Navy folks, we love each other. But he understands that. If you served in the military, you understand it. You voluntarily put yourself submission or under the authority of somebody else. It does not make that other person a better person. I've served under a lot of people I don't think were all there. I didn't think they were very capable. But I still had to voluntarily put myself under their authority because that's the way the military works, looking for submission. Well, you say, preacher, what if you weren't submissive? I wouldn't be in the military. Either that or I'd be by myself in some little cell by myself, still in the military. It's just how it was. Ladies, I hope you don't feel that way, that you're in a cell. No, that's all right. Submissive, voluntarily submitting yourself. Mary was submissive. First of all, she was submissive to the Lord. Submissive to the Lord. That's why in Luke 1.38... And after it was announced to her what was transpiring, she asked the question, how can I know this? And they told her, well, it's going to be the Holy Ghost is going to overshadow you, and the child will be the Son of God. And Mary said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord. She said, I'm just the servant. I'm just the maid. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. So it says, be according to me according to thy word. We turn that around. We say, God, let it be my way. Let it be my way. Let it be according to me by what I say. And so we've got, she was there according to the Word. She was submissive to the Word. Let's be submissive to the Word. Preacher, what can I learn? An amazing story how Christ was born of a virgin. But one of the character traits that allowed her to be used of God, to put her as one of the vessels that God could use, is the same character trait God wants from us, so God can use us. If we can't say, Behold the handmaid, behold the servant of the Lord, be it according to you, according to all your word, then we are not always ready to be used by God. A wonderful story of the virgin birth, but she was a woman submissive to the Lord. Let's be submissive to all the word of the Lord. All of it. All of it. Now see, in the military, again, I use that as an illustration because many of us understand that. At least we've seen movies and read books. If I'm submissive in the military, I have to submit to how many of the orders? How about just most of them? It's all of them. It's all of them. I can't choose orders to obey and orders to disobey. So, so it is in our heart. If we're submissive to God, listen carefully, I have to be submissive according to all His Word. 
If I'm rebellious over here, I'm not submissive. If I'm picking and choosing over here, I'm not submissive. And so we learn this character of called Mary. She was submissive to the Lord. In Luke 1, 48, she says, For he, speaking about God, regardeth the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. So she was submissive to the Lord. Number two, she was submissive to her husband. There's an amazing thought for you. She was submissive to her own husband. We know the story. After Mary and Joseph, after the baby was born, Herod was angry and he was going to have all the children two years and under killed. And the Bible tells us in Mark, Matthew chapter 2, And when they were departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph in a dream. Not Mary, Joseph. Saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. For thou sh and, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. So here he is. Mar here it is. Mary has just recently had a child. We think since the Magi were there, it was a couple of years later. But they was there. And all of a sudden, he gets up there in the middle of the night and says, We've got to go. We are up and out of here. She said, well, what about my furniture? We can't take it. What about this? We're not going to take it. What about my neighbors? Can't talk to them. What about my folks? Can't send them a letter. We got to go now. And he took her. She was submissive to her own husband. And they went. Now, think about what it would be like in your household, or my household maybe, if we woke your wife up in the middle of the night and said, Hey, pack up, we're going. you got one hour. We're out of here. After you came to, <laughs> no, I'm not going. I've got this to be done. I got you. Can't do this. You haven't thought this through. You haven't. She was submissive. God's as wonderful as Mary was. This is just some principles to help us be used of God. As wonderful and pure as Mary was, still God spoke to Joseph and said, "Take Mary and the baby." Men, let's make sure we live our lives so our brides can be confident to be submissive to us. See, if Joseph was a rascal, it would be hard for Mary to be submissive to. Be the man that your wife can submit to. Ladies, submit to your husband. That's principle. That's principle because God had that in plan. Now, ladies, let me remind you, your first place to be submissive to is not your husband. It's the Lord. Are you listening? 99% of the time, if you've got a saved husband, a godly husband, it's going to be submitting to your husband is for submitting to the Lord because you do that as it. But if the husband would ever say, we're going to violate God's word, we're going to violate God's principle, your first responsibility is to the Lord. Merry Christmas. So Mary, what do we learn about Mary? What a wonderful story. Jesus Christ, virgin born. God coming from Mary as a promise from Genesis chapter 3 on. What a wonderful thing. But she was not perfect, but she was pure in her body and pure in her spirit. But she was then not just pretty, but submissive. Let's learn so God can use us in whatever area He wants to learn. Number two, we look at Joseph. Look at Joseph. And we know Joseph. Again, if you've been saved very long and studied the Bible very long, you have an idea, you have a feeling, you know Joseph. Notice, but just two character traits of Joseph this morning that we need to apply to our lives. Joseph, number one, first of all, he was a man of patience. He was a man of patience. Matthew 1.20 But while he thought on these things, what things? His wife-to-be, his girlfriend, his fiance that he'd been pure with that he had expected her to be pure is pregnant he knew that by law he could have her killed he was thinking an alternate would be I'll just send her away somewhere I'll just get her a ticket somewhere and let her go. So while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared in him in dreams, saying, Joseph, 
Thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. We find him being patient. In other words, he was waiting on God. He did not react out of hand. He did not blow up out of hand. But there he began to think on those things, to ponder those things. He was patient. The word patient simply means to cheerfully endure. Jesus put it this way in Luke 21, 19. In your patience, parents, this is what you teach your kids. In your patience, possess your souls. In other words, learn to get a hold of yourself. Learn to control yourself. In your patience, in your cheerfully enduring, get a hold of that spirit inside. Have you ever been out of control? Anybody besides me? Two, three, on? Right. I mean, just, you look back and you say, but that was dumb. You either get real angry and you flare up or you say things or you just... And you look back and say, that is not how Christians behave. I need to possess my souls. That's why when your child is having temper tantrums, you learn to teach them to possess their souls. In their, get a hold of yourself. Get a hold of yourself. Calm down. You have to train that because our nature is to be out of it. Here he says, his, his fiance, his girlfriend, the one he thought was going to be pure, the one they'd spent the, since he's known her with at least the six inch rule. Remember the six inch rule? Six inches between guys and girls until they're married. Then it's six feet when it's my kids. No, okay. But she's expecting us. So instead of saying, I'm out of here, I'm done, I hate you, you, you worthless woman. No, he, he began to think, what am I going to do? What should I do? He was patient. And he thought on those things. Let's learn, listen, let's learn from Joseph when your world falls apart. And it did. Wait on God. Find the answer from God before you react. Find the answer from God before you make a foolish decision. So that's why we have to know what God wants us to do before we do it. How many times in your life, I know in my life, I've blown it because I did not wait. I did not seek for it. So he was a man of patience. Letting God give the answer from his word, by his spirit. You say, preacher, how can I do that? Psalm 27, 13. I can't remember if it's in your notes or not. Write it down. Psalm 27, 13. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So listen, he said, I'm about ready to die. I'm about to faint. I'm falling apart in this thing. My life's falling apart. He said, I would have fainted. I would have been a falling apart. I would have died. I would have just messed up. I had fainted unless I believed on the goodness of the Lord. You say, preacher, where does it start? Just believing God is good. Oh, but my life's a mess. But God is good. But my, but my family did this, or my children did this, or my wife did this. So I, what am I going to... I'm just going to believe God is good. Amen. In the land of the living, and then wait on Him. Wait on God's answer. Wait on God's provision. If you ask Joseph today and say, aren't you glad you waited until God spoke to you before you sent her out, before you brought her in front of the other people, before you had her stoned, aren't you glad you waited on God while He thought on those things. Let's be men who can be patient. Be patient. He was a man of patience. Number two, he was a man of security. And this goes along with the patience. A man of security. So his espoused wife, by the way, Joseph had a, had a good testimony. No doubt. He was a man of holiness and of righteousness and of purity himself. Now his espoused wife is expecting. And if he takes her as his own, then they'll assume he's the father. Or a fool. If he doesn't take her, he's going to violate God's will. Because God says, no, you take her. The Lord says, you take her. Matthew 1, 24. Then Joseph, being raised from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Once he got the answer from God, he acted upon it, and obeyed it, 
in spite of what other people were going to say. See, that's, that's, you're secure in God. That was his security. His security was in God. Not in what his daddy was going to say. Not what Mary's parents were going to say. Not in what his co-workers were going to say. He says, that, that, I said, they're going to rail on me. They're going to criticize me. They may blackball me. My, he said, my carpenter business may go out the window. He said, because of this, because of the unrighteous stories that will go around. He said, but my security is not in what man will say. My security is not what man will do. He said, my security is in what God says. So he was a man secure enough to be different from the world. Secure enough to face the, the criticisms of the world. Secure enough to obey God rather than man. It says in Hebrews 13, 6, So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Romans eight thirty one. What shall we then say of these things? If God be for us, Joseph, is God for you? He said, yeah, God told me to take it. He said, it's not what you think, Joseph. It's not what it looks like. It's going to be my son that I promised. It's going to save his people from the sins. Go ahead and take her. And Joseph said, all right then, Lord, I will take her. Then what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. You now the world may throw things at you and call you names and criticize you, but they have no real position to judge, only God. When it gets down to the end, it's only going to be God. It is God that justifies. So he was secure in that. So fellas, let's find what God says. Let's take that patience and regardless of what's happening in our lives, and say, this is what God would have me do with this. This is how God would have me respond. And I'm going to trust Him and I'm going to live for Him regardless of what the rest of the world will say. A lot of times we are mocked as God's people because we do what's right. How many times have you been told, just tell them it came broken? You broke it because, fellas, you didn't read the instructions. You know, you know man's motto? If it sticks, force it. If it breaks, it needed replacing anyway. Just tell them it came broken. Just tell them it never came. Just tell them you never got the letter. Say, no, I can't do that. Why? Because God says, you fool. You idiot. That's going to cost you. You're going to lose your house because of that. You're going to lose your job because of that. You're... Security is no. I have patience. I sought God. God, what do you want me to do about it? He told me. And then in security, in God, we just obey. Joseph, a man of patience. Joseph, a man of security. Well, so God could use him. If he was not patient, Joseph would have blown up and God said, well, now, now what are we going to do? If he was not a one of security to go ahead and take her and take the Ridicule, by the way, ridicule followed the Lord with that. The Pharisees said, we know who our father is. Joseph no doubt took the ridicule, but he, had a, he was a man of security. These are the characteristics, character traits that God helps us and wants us to have. So we find Mary, a woman of purity and of submission. Joseph, a man of patience and security. You now the shepherds. The shepherds. Oh, we sing about the shepherds. We talk about the shepherds. What an amazing group of fellows they were. In Luke 2, 8, it says, They were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. These were unusual people. They were there. and well, What a blessing. What a blessing they got to be there. What a blessing they got to be have their lives dictated here in Scripture, revealed to us that their lives would be different. The stories they could tell. What a blessing. But what about these men, these shepherds? What character traits did they have? Number one, they were people of position. They were people of position. Or you might say place and practice and performance and post, whatever it is. They were men in position. The shepherds. Here's a tough theological question for you. Are you ready? What was their job? Cheap. They were not doctors of theology. They were sheep herders. They weren't medical doctors. They weren't rich businessmen. 
They weren't tech gurus. They were shepherds. They had a position. A position. So very quickly, the position, we find it's position of the divine in life. Position of divine in life. Let me help you with something. I've known people that have messed up their lives. You've known people that have messed up your life. Maybe in parts you've messed up your life because we did not accept God's position for us. See, God has given us all a calling in all positions. I'm not saying we shouldn't try to make ourselves better. Amen? Hello? That doesn't mean that. Doesn't mean you're not supposed to make all the money God will let you make legally and honestly. Remember, you're supposed to make all the money you can legally and honestly that God will let you, and then tithe. tithe. Very, very good. All right, so. But they had a position in life. A calling in life. Were somewhere where God wanted them to be. 1 Corinthians 7, God put it this way. This is just to help us in looking at the Christmas story. What happens if one of these guys, he says, shepherd says, you know, I don't want to be a shepherd. I changed my mind. I felt God called me a shepherd. I was born into a shepherd's family, and I got the training, and that's what I thought I wanted to do. But, you know, I got kind of tired of it, and I didn't want it anymore. And it just, you know, I think God still blessed me as being a shepherd, but I've changed my mind. I don't want to be a shepherd. He would have messed up. He would have missed the opportunity to be used of God. But these guys were there in a position of the divine. 1 Corinthians 7.20. Listen carefully. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. So God gives you a place in life. God's giving you a position. God gives you a vocation. God gives you the place he wants you to be and wants you to serve. It says then we're supposed to abide in that calling. Art thou called to be a, being a servant? Care not for it? But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. So whether a servant or a slave in this case, or a master or free, he said, use it rather, as God says. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. So here's a slave who says, you may not like being the servant, you may not like being the slave, but if God's called you to be a slave, you are free in the Lord. He said, that's the position that God has put. You now, God's not saying he's for slavery. He's just saying that's the way it was. He said, if you are, he said, that's where you find yourself. That's your calling in life. He says, then you are the Lord's freeman if you serve the Lord in that position. Likewise, also that he is called being free is Christ's servant. So even as a slave serving the Lord, you're just as free as the one who's free who's serving as a slave to the Lord. What a wonderful thought. You go back and study that at another time. Likewise also is he called, being free as Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price, but not ye the servants of men. Or be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man where he is called, therein abide with God. Again, it doesn't say you shouldn't try to make yourself better if God called you to a spot. But I'm saying if God has given you a calling, God has given you a position, you stay there until he changes it. Amen. You stay in that. Of course, things are going to get tired. Things are going to get lonely. Things are going to be difficult. But they were there in a position of divine calling. So where God has placed you, let's learn to love it and serve God through it. And if God opens up the doors and God's opened up the way and God works in your heart, yeah, God can move. God does change. If God hadn't called me to preach at age 31 or 32, I would have been somewhere completely different. I've been back maybe down to Houston Lighting and Power at the South Texas Nuclear Project, still teaching. Opera. I don't know where I've been. But God called in my life and said, this is now the calling of your life. And so I stepped out. You say, preacher, has it always been perfect? It sure has. But that's the calling of life. So where has God called you? So these shepherds, they were in a position of divine calling. A position of the divine in their life. Make sure you, That's why you've got to make sure you know what God wants for you. Not what your friends want for you. Not what society wants for you, but what God wants for you. The position of the divine also is a position of duty. Just like the position of divine is in life, so the position of duty is in time. I think it's there in your notes. See, they were in the right place. Yeah, let me help you. Did you ever see, did you ever say, well, I guess I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or, oh, so-and-so, yeah, he's just lucky because he was just in the right place at the right time. Look at your notes. They were in the right place because they were right in their place. Are you listening to me? The preacher, how can I be in the right place? You just be right in your place. Husbands, you know where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be? Be in the right place by being right in your place.
Ladies, keep yourselves right. How? By being in the right place. How's that? By being right in your place. Preachers, be right in your place. Dads, be right in your place. Shepherds, they were right in the place. They were, they were in the field at night, keeping watch over their flock by night. They were there in the night. They could have said, you know, I'm going to, Joe, handle this. I'm going to slip out tonight and go into town. Nobody's going to know. The boss man won't know. And he would have missed it. No. They were people of position. Divine position. Wasn't always the best place, but that's what God had it for them. And they, God blessed them. It was a position of duty in time. So in the church, in our home, in our life, let's just be in position of duty where God wants us to be. So they were position. Position. That's their character trait. They were just in their spot. Just in their spot. Secondly, they were people of soul winning. People of soul winning. Say, so what does that mean? They were proclaiming. They were proclaiming. Luke 2, 17. We know the story. They went down. They saw it. The angels revealed it to them. They went down and saw it. And in verse Luke 2, 17, And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying. They just didn't talk one to another. They just didn't whisper it. They said, we're going to have to write this down somewhere. They made it known abroad the saying which was told them concerning that child. They were proclaiming what God said who Jesus was. They were proclaiming what God said about the Savior being born. The one that had been promised. The one who was going to die for their sins. The one they were looking for. The Savior is born. And they went about telling it. They went about proclaiming it. In other words, they were witnesses. We talk about being a witness. A witness. If you're going to be a witness, you only witness what you know. If you're just telling what somebody else told you, it's called hearsay. And it's not admissible. See, here's one of the reasons why a lot of people call themselves Christians when they are not have any desire to witness because all they know is hearsay. They've not experienced it. They don't know. They just know what they've been told. And they're just past trying to pass on what they've been told. The witnesses. Here they say, well, look what we saw, look what we heard, and they went about proclaiming it. Not only proclaiming it, so when they were proclaiming it, but they were praising. They were praising. Luke 2.20 And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Let me help you with something. They were proclaiming because they had something to praise about. Are you listening to me? They were able to proclaim because they had something to praise about. A lot of times we don't, again it goes back, people have no desire to proclaim who Jesus is. Proclaim there's a hell and there's a heaven and Jesus came to pay for our sin debt. That's what we celebrate Christmas for. That he came to die for our sins on the cross of Calvary so we can go to heaven and not go to hell. We have we want to, ought to be proclaiming that during this season. But many times we don't proclaim because we don't have anything to praise about. I want you to notice also the praising. This will help you. You say, I know I ought to be telling people, but I'm scared and all this. The praising came after the proclaiming. They went out and proclaimed all they seen and heard. Then they went home praising. Lord, I should talk to that person. I'm scared to death. I don't know how to talk. I'm, I, I, whew, my stomach hurts. Lord, I think I better go home. I'm getting sick. No, it's just nerves. Well, what do I say? After you proclaim, then there's some praising. Glory. Thank you, Lord, for helping me. Thank you, Lord, for saving them. Or thank you, Lord, for letting me get the gospel out, giving the gospel to them. The praising came after the proclaiming. So they were people of soul winning, just getting the gospel out. God let them see, let them know, so they could go proclaim it, and so they could praise and glorify God. Lastly, we find the Christ. The one it's all about. The one we celebrate Christmas for. The Christ. If I was going to preach on the character of Christ, we'd be here. Well, we'd just be here. Two thoughts about the Christ and the character. Number one, His person. His person. He is the fullness of the Godhead. You say, what's the character of Christ? He's God. He's God. As you study the book, and I'm glad we've got a book that tells us about God. 
And who he is and who he's not, what he likes, what he doesn't like, what he'll do, what he won't do, his nature. I'm glad we've got a book. You say, so what is Jesus like? What's his character? He is God. He's the fullness of the Godhead. Colossians 2, nine. a little theological thought. For, he, for in him, Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness. How much of the fullness, class? All of it. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. See, what's the Godhead? 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The Godhead is the Father, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Those three are one, but in Jesus Christ, in Him dwelleth or liveth the fullness, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You say, what does that mean? You want to understand what the God, what the God the Father is like? You look at Jesus Christ. You want to know what God the Holy Spirit is? You look at Jesus Christ. God the Son, He is in Jesus Christ. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Because each one is God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. These three are one. Each one are God. Each one are equal. Amen. One is not subservient to the other. Jesus Christ submitted Himself in the flesh to the Father, if you will, to go to the cross because that was the plan. That was all their plan. But He submitted to the will of the Father in the flesh flesh as a man to go to the cross. But in him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus Christ is God. He's as much God as God the Father. He's as much God as the Holy Spirit. He is God. John 14, 9. Jesus saith in him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then? Show us the Father. John 10, 31. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. See, preacher, I have trouble wrapping my mind around that. Of course you do. You're just human. But what a wonderful truth. In Jesus Christ, the Godhead bodily. In that little baby laying there in the manger. By the way, he didn't all of a sudden become God when he turned 30 years old. He didn't become God when he was age 12 and started arguing with the doctors. He was God from before that. In the Old Testament, we find Jesus Christ appearing before he got his incarnate flesh. He had flesh he had borrowed. He dealt with people. Melchizedek and others, places he showed up, but he took on flesh in the manger. When he was conceived by Mary and the Holy Spirit, he became flesh, and he still, he still has that flesh only glorified. He's still got the holes in it. He's still got the side. But he is God. Say, what's Christ like? He's God. He's God. So we find his person, God. Then, of course, we find his salvation. His salvation. That's what he came for. He didn't come for Bing Crosby to make a bunch of money singing songs. He didn't come for Walmart to start at Easter selling Christmas trees. He came to die for your sins and mine. That's what He came for. If there was any other way for us to get to heaven, if there was any other way for us who He loves, to not go to hell, He would not have come. But He came because that's the only way. Luke ten nineteen, Jesus said, For the Son of Man, speaking about Himself, who is full God and full man both, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. I'm not saying you should add this to the Scripture, but you could add this to your Bible. For the Son of Man has come to seek you. Put your name in there. And to save you. That was lost. Second Timothy 2.10 Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus. Romans 10.12 For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. No difference between the Jew and the Gentile, male, female. There is no difference. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation. That's what He came for. And when you know that and you realize that you're a sinner just like all of us headed for hell but Jesus Christ came and paid the sin debt for you and provided the only way for you to get to heaven and you put your faith and trust in Him, acknowledge Him as the Lord, acknowledge Him as God and believe He died for your sins and rose again and in faith call upon Him and trust Him only for salvation. Not Jesus and communion. Not Jesus and baptism. Not Jesus and this. And Jesus said, just Jesus, what He did on the cross of Calvary. And you receive that gift of eternal life. Boy, and you're saved. Then Christmas really means something. Then you'll know why the shepherds had to go and tell. 
and why they praised. Then you know why God was looking around for a virgin, decided he hadn't married, because he's looking for that pure one to produce his son. So this morning, if you're not saved, why don't you get saved? I look around, most of you have been in church so many years in your life, you know what being saved is, but are you saved? Don't justify it to me. You'll stand before God one day. And God knows. Get saved today. Say, preacher, I am saved. Well, let's learn. Let's learn about Mary. Purity. Ooh. Submission. Joseph, his patience. I'm just going to learn to wait on him. Then I'm going to be secure in God. I'm going to go ahead and tell people I'm saved. I'm going to go ahead and give, invite folks to church. I'm going to go ahead and live right and live holy. Because I'm secure. By the way, not be secure in who you are. Be secure in who he is. And like the shepherds. Wow. The position God has given to you. And let's win those souls. Give the gospel. Why? Because Jesus is God. And He came to save. Let's bow our heads, please.